We have a very special guest alert on today's episode. We are bringing on Daniel Popper from The Athletic to talk about the biggest reason Justin Herbert has had struggles this year and if the defense can turn it around over the final 10 games. You are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up and welcome into the Lockdown Chargers podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wade, joined as always by my co-host, David Jokemar, and we've been covering the Chargers together now for over six seasons, but this is our fifth season as host of the Lockdown Chargers podcast, bringing you your team every day. Thank you guys so much for making us your first listen, and if you never want to miss an interview like Daniel Popper today, make sure you're subscribed to the Lockdown Chargers YouTube channel and also following the show for free on all platforms wherever you get your podcast from. But today's episode of Lockdown Chargers is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projections, you can win up to 10 times your money on your entry. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. That's prizepicks.com, promo code locked on. All right, David, we are excited to bring on Daniel Popper. I mean, I think the most plugged in Chargers beat writer, basically, right? And I think the Athletic puts out just great content. But we wanted to talk with him about Justin Herbert in his perceived struggles and how nobody ever really talks about the other things going on around Justin Herbert and also Joe Lombardi, because even with, you know, the injuries and things like that, the offense still hasn't been good. Are the calls for his head warranted? We're going to get into that with Daniel Popper. And also if the Chargers defense can get better down the final 10 games of the season, because we know they're going to have to be right. And also just how much pressure this Chargers coaching staff is feeling right now, because If they don't do well towards the end of this season, they're going to be two seasons in a row not making the playoffs with Justin Herbert as their quarterback. And maybe some heads will roll if that happens to happen. But here he is, Daniel Popper. All right, guys, we are here with the very special guest that we promised you. We have the Athletics' Daniel Popper. He is someone that is putting out the best Chargers content in the business, the best written content. And the only thing I'm willing to pay for a paywall for the Athletic, where I get you know the best Chargers information. If you haven't subscribed to the Athletic already, make sure you do that. And if you haven't already, make sure to go follow Daniel Popper on Twitter at Daniel R. Popper. But it's the bye week, and we couldn't think of anyone better to have on for this week with a huge important stretch of games coming up for the Chargers. Chargers. So thank you, Popper, for coming on today, man. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me, guys. No problem at all. Well, let's get right into it, too. And I think that, I mean, obviously, you see the things that Chargers fans get upset about on Twitter. I mean, a lot of it has been directed to you at times and at us. We all feel it. But one of the biggest storylines from fans and from sports media outlets alike has been Justin Herbert's so-called regression, right? And it seems like one of the things that's always kind of left out in that conversation is the context of what Justin Herbert has been dealing with, right? Whether it's his own injury, the injuries to his players around him, play calling, or whatever that may be. So what have been your impressions of Justin Herbert so far in year three? I mean, he's hurt. I, I feel like a lot of the times these, these conversations don't factor in all of the important facets of the situation. The guy's hurt, like very hurt. Like, And anyone that read me as soon as he got hurt knew this was going to be a season-long issue knew that fractured rib cartilage is more painful oftentimes than a fractured rib. And you saw it in how he was playing. I mean, he, he could barely move in that Jacksonville game the way that in terms of the way that he wanted to. And that stretched on for several games. I mean, like if a guy fractures his rib cartilage, he's obviously not going to be the same player. I don't like it. To me, it's not that like difficult of a conversation to have. Sure. Like go back and look at any quarterback that has tried to play through this specific injury. They're not having all pro seasons. They're not winning the MVP with fractured rib cartilage. Like it's a very debilitating injury. And I think the the further away he's gotten from it, the better he's played, the more he's looked like himself, but you have to factor that in. You have to factor that in when you're talking about it. And so, and then like, and then you factor in all these other injuries that they had on offense, you know, over through, through these first, you know, seven games of the season. Like when you lose your best receiver and the best, arguably third down receiver in the league, that's going to impact how you perform as an offense. When you're starting center, all pro center, who coordinates a lot of your pass protection and is the engine behind your running game, when he's basically only been fully healthy for two games, that's going to impact how you play on offense. When you lose your all pro left tackle, and yes, Jamari Salyer has played well, when that happens, that's going to impact how you pass protect. And so, like, I don't know, like it doesn't, it doesn't feel like that 
that difficult of a conversation. Like, it doesn't feel that hard to wrap your mind around. Like, when you lose a lot of really, really good players, it's not going to look the same. And then, you know, if, and then you apply that to the quarterback who's not 100% healthy and is not even close to 100% healthy and hasn't been anywhere close to 100% healthy. You get a worse product. Like, that's just what it is. And, and we can talk about the rest of the stuff, but any conversation around this team and regression and statistical steps back and all that stuff has to start with injuries. And if you're not starting there, then you just don't want to live in truth. That's just the facts. Yeah, I think most people think that Justin Herbert is superhuman and that he's not going to be affected by injury. And, he, and I think that's one thing we need to remember. Like, he, he is a human being just like everyone else. Of course, the injuries are going to play a factor, especially when we're talking about playing one of the most violent games in the world. We're talking yeah. about football here. Offensive coordinator Joe Lombardi has also taken a lot of flack here from fans. <laughs> and, you know, the Chargers offense definitely has not lived up to expectations. There's been a lot of long, scoreless stretches in every game, but he hasn't had his full complement of, of weapons either. All things considered, do you think the questions about Lombardi's play calling and if he's the right coordinator for Justin Herbert are warranted? Uh, listen, I get the frustrations because I see the same thing that everyone else is seeing. Like, it does feel like a lot of these plays are super condensed. A lot of the route combinations are super condensed. But again, like, you have to look at it in context, right? And this guy did produce, you know, the fourth best offense in the league last year. So, you know, I, I feel like a lot of the conversations sort of devolve into fire this guy and find somebody else. But everything I see is fire Joe Lombardi and hire Sean Payton. Guess who yeah. runs the exact same offense? Sean Payton, Joe Lombardi coached for Sean Payton for 12 years. And if Sean Payton was to become the head coach of the Chargers, guess who would be his offensive coordinator? That'd be wild. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. It wouldn't be wild. It's exactly how he set up his staff in New Orleans. Pete Carmel is not leaving New Orleans now that he's the play caller there. Like, if you hire Sean Payton, Joe Lombardi is going to be on the staff. And so this is like what I'm talking about. You, people have these conversations and they're just frustrated and they yell this stuff into the ether without actually thinking it through, you know? Yeah. But like, I, listen, I understand the frustrations, but like, I, I like to have these conversations and, and see the full picture. Sure. And I think this is why people get pissed at me, right? Instead of being like, Joe Lombardi is the reason it's not working. Well, no. Is it, is he part of the reason? Does he have to do better? Yeah, absolutely. But he's also been able to mitigate some of these injuries. Like they're still four and three. They've yeah. won some games here. The offense has played well in stretches and he's done that. Without Rashawn Slater, without Corey Lindsley, without Keenan Allen, without Donald Parham, a guy we haven't mentioned yet, he was going to be a massive part of this offense. Like all of that stuff matters. And I think he's been able to mitigate it. Like, like Jamari Salyer coming in and playing well, like you can't just put all of that on the player. And then when things go bad, put that all on the coach. Like yeah, it has to be, yeah. it has to be both of them at the same time. So the fact that Jamari Salyer has come in and played pretty well you got to give some credit to the coaching staff. You got to give some credit to the scheme. How long Joe Lombardi is helping Jamari Seller on, the, on that left side in terms of chipping, in terms of help, in terms of play calls, in terms of scheme and design. Like all of that stuff helps the le rookie left tackle sixth rounder play well. So I, I don't think you can look at the offense and say, yeah, everyone's doing a great job. And I, and I don't think anyone's saying that. Does Joe Lombardi have to do better? Yeah. Does he have to find a way to run the ball better? I think that specifically is a really important thing because they have not yes. been able to run the ball. And not being able to run the ball against the Seahawks, I think, was a huge disappointment for them because we've all seen what the Seahawks are as a run defense. At the same time, like when you lose all of these great players, it's really hard to play consistently. And like it doesn't all fall on the scheme and it doesn't all fall on the design. At some point, like when you're losing all of your elite talent, it's really hard to produce. And I'm not trying to make excuses for him, but that's like you have to look at the whole picture. Has it been yeah. good enough? No. Does he deserve some blame? Yes, but he also deserves some credit for how he's coached some of these guys up and been able to mitigate some of these injuries. Like, I think you have to look at the whole picture and, and everyone's going to call me like, you know, I don't even know all these crazy things that people have been calling me on Twitter that I'm a Homer or whatever, but like the facts are the facts. And like, you cannot just attack somebody for the negatives without viewing the positives that they brought to the table as well. And I, and like, yeah. I'll keep going back to it. You can't have these conversations without talking about the injuries. And I know no one wants to hear those excuses, but it's like, it's the reason, like it's the reason yeah. it hasn't looked good like that, that like, and you know, there's a lot of reasons, but the, for me, the primary sure. reason is these injuries. And then you have an all pro quarterback that you expect to be, be able to do certain things and he can't do them because he's injured. And like all yeah. of that, all of that's part of it. So I hear the complaints, but I don't think that you can just pin it all on him and, and seal it up. You know, like there's more to it than that. There always is. But how dare you not fire someone on our show like that? That's just rude now. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And Keenan Allen, you know, hopefully he comes back and, and solves a lot of it. It would be nice to have him and Mike together, which looks like it's not going to happen, at least for the foreseeable future, because there's a reason you want two of those dudes 
on the field at the same time. But the offense obviously hasn't been good enough, and there's a variety of reasons for that, including the personnel that they have right there because of those injuries, right? The receivers they have running the routes that Joe Lombardi's calling, which haven't been good enough yet. The Chargers have been quiet so far at the NFL trade deadline, which we're creeping up on today as you guys are hearing this. So we'll talk about with Daniel Popper why the Chargers haven't made a trade at this point, or at least if he's surprised that they haven't. And also if there's any hope that the Chargers defense can improve over the back half of the season. We're going to get into that coming up right after this. Before we get back to Daniel Popper, I do need to tell you guys about my favorite daily fantasy site. And of course, I'm talking about Price Picks. What I love about Price Picks is you get to go through and pick the projections that you want to go against. And all you have to do is beat Price Picks projections. It's not you versus another person. You get to go through and pick the matchups that you like the most. For example, this weekend against the Atlanta Falcons, you could go more than or less than 260.5 passing yards for Justin Herbert. If you think he's going to bounce back and have a big game, you could also go with Austin Eckler. If you think he's going to have more or less than 53 and a half rushing yards going up against a very bad Atlanta rush defense. So you get to pick and choose, and you can even win up to 10 times your money on any entries. The price picks works for not just football, though. If you guys want to check out other sports, you can still do it with the NBA, which just started back up. Hockey, which is back now. You can go MMA. You can even go college football as well. Anything that you're looking for, you can find projections at pricepicks.com and always get safe and fast withdrawals. Right now, guys, make sure you go download the Price Picks app or go to pricepicks.com to sign up today to play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. That means you deposit $100, they will match your $100. If you put in $50, they'll match your $50. So don't forget to use the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. We are back here with Daniel Popper of The Athletic, who covers the Chargers and does it extremely well. Make sure to go subscribe to The Athletic and Daniel Popper's writing if you have not already. But time to get back into this. And Daniel, as we're talking, this is the night before the NFL trade deadline and the Chargers have yet to make a move, which Tom Telesco has only done once in his career, right? And it's 10 seasons as general manager, as we're seeing it right now. But yet this year, it does feel like with the huge need at wide receiver, which is very apparent with needs at edge rusher, which they only have brought in Jeremiah Tauchu so far that they should be a team like some of these other competing teams out there that should go make a move. Have you been surprised so far that we haven't heard anything yet? Not surprised. Cause like, you know, when a guy operates the same way for a decade, like you sort of expect him to continue operating that way. So like, I'm not surprised. I thought the, the Robert Quinn deal would have made sense. That one, I, I still haven't been able to wrap my mind around because you talk about, you give up a fourth round pick. It's not a ton of value. And the bears are like basically taking on all the salary for players. Yeah. I mean, they took on, um, a, ton of, a ton of salary in the Roquan Smith trade that they did today. And so you talk about like, you can fit that into the cap. It ended up being like, you know, $700,000 and change in salary that you're, that you're taking on there. You really like, you need a player there. Um, but they don't think Chris Rumpf is going to be out that long. They have Kyle Van Noy. They know Joey's going to be back at some point and they feel like they can keep their head above water in terms of that rotation opposite Khalil Mack until Joey Bosa comes back and, and still have a, a significant chance of, of pushing for the playoffs and, and, and potentially contending, you know, and that's the deal that I can't remember around the, the wide receiver stuff. I just don't understand. Like you guys tell me, who are they trading for? Like Brandon cooks has $18 million guaranteed next year. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, Elijah, I get, Moore, I, I think... Elijah Moore, let me throw another name out that I've seen everywhere. Elijah Moore yeah. is now upset and talking publicly about he's upset because he's the third option in New York. What would he be if he came to Los Angeles? Oh, hundred percent. When Mike and Keenan are on the field, which they both will be within you know two to three weeks, he's the third option. So by the time he gets acclimated to the offense and the scheme, two to three weeks down the road, he's going to be in the exact same situation he is in New York now, in terms of the number of balls that he's getting and in terms of how upset he is. And that's not something yeah. you want to bring in. What about right? Nelson Aguilar? I, I mean, I yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, it, it especially really? like I don't know what do you like. Is that the difference? No, I mean, right? it's like, it's not the difference. I think for most Charger fans, it's like, how can you stay in Pat and do nothing? You know what I mean? Especially with Keenan Allen out right now. Mike Williams probably going to miss a month of playing time, right? And you yeah, just well, have- like, okay, Keenan's going to be back soon. Like, even if he misses this week, he's going to be back really soon. Like, he's very sure. close to being back. Mike is going to be a little bit longer. Um, you know, definitely not this week probably not the next week but the week after that you're 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 talking about it so do you give up draft capital to have a receiver come in for two weeks by the time he gets acclimated it's like all right you you have mike and keenan back so i think like the and I, listen you can think about this and view it however you want I, i'll tell yeah. you how the team thinks about it they're saying okay we have so many of these guys injured we're going to get these guys back 
And that's going to be effectively the same as trading for somebody and bringing in talent. Like as you get, as they get these guys back, Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, and Josh Palmer. I'll, I'll ask you guys. I don't know if you've read, read my stuff. You might know the answer to this question. How many snaps do you think those three players have played on the field together this season? 15. 13. Ah, damn, 13 I read that snaps. one too. I was so close. <laughs> That's you go into right. You go into a season, you say, okay, these are our top three wide receivers. And when we go to 11 personnel, these are going to be our guys. Yeah. And they've played 13 snaps together through seven weeks. And you feel like by, you know, let's say week 13, definitely going to have all three of those guys on the field together. Like that's what Brandon Staley said. Like we want to wait to see what this actually looks like before, you know, we make a move here and and bring somebody in. So I I understand it. I think anyone that's been following this team or in your guys' case is rooting for this team for a while. You shouldn't be surprised because they're not going to make a deal for somebody that they don't think is going to, is going to, give them production moving forward. They're not just going to trade for names. They're not going to make trades just to make trades and appease the fan base. You can love it. You can hate it. It's how they go about it. Now, like if something happens tomorrow, would I be surprised? No, but it has to align with the philosophy that they've always had, which is that they're not going to overpay. They're not going to make a trade just to trade. And they're going to bring in somebody that they feel like has their best football in front of them, or at least can give them good football moving forward. And like, I got like Nelson Aguilar, like, sure, trade for him. Fans are happy. He comes in and he probably doesn't really produce that much, especially when they get these guys back. And so what are you giving up that draft capital for? Listen, I get what you're saying. I get sure. what the fans are saying, but this is how they're viewing it. Like they look at it and they say, they, these guys have been on the field for 13 snaps. We're going to get all three of them back at some point. Like they don't really feel like they need an addition there at receiver. And like the time to add speed was the off season. Like, that, like that's I, the hard we, thing. Yeah. We all saw it. We all felt yeah. it. And they're like, okay, you're thin there. If Jalen Guyton goes down, what do you have speed wise? Nothing. You know, they would tell you that they can access the deep part of the field. I feel like, you know, with Mike Williams, sure, he can access the deep part of the field, but he gets there a lot slower than a guy that runs a 4 3. <laughs> That's right. I, like, it's, you know, I think in a perfect world, they would have a 4 3 guy on the roster that they felt really good about. That was Jalen Guyton. Uh, but I don't think that guy's available at the right price. And, and they're not going to make a trade just to make a trade. It's not going to happen. All right, well, switching gears here to the defensive side, the Chargers defense has been the second worst unit in the league, allowing 27 points per game through seven Mm -hmm. games. Is there any reason to think that this defense can be better over the final 10 games? Yeah, I don't think it's been that bad. Like, I know if you look at it in terms of the number of points they've given up, they've given up. So, like, DVOA, they're like 17th or something like that. Right, and you factor in. Right, right, right. Adjusted DVOA, you talk about, like, okay, they've played some really good offenses, and I know people don't give the Seahawks credit, but they are a top five offense in the league this year, right? The Chiefs are a really good offense. Yeah. You know, the Browns have a really good offense. The Jags and the Raiders have pretty good offenses. So you you factor that in, right? The issue here is the big plays. And and anyone that watches this team knows. Oh, yeah. like you can't you can't give up that many long runs. And the crazy part is, like, if you take I, – I took those four runs away, or I guess – what is it? Five runs now. Yeah. So the, the Edwards Hilaire run in against the Chiefs, 52 yards. The Robinson run, 50 yards. The Pierce, Pierce 75-yard run. You had uh, the 41-yard Chubb run. Yep. And then you had the Kenneth Walker 74-yard run. That's yep. five plays right there. They are, like, last in – in total EPA allowed on defense. If you take those four runs away, they're in the top 10. <laughs> like it's just, that's it. But like that, like football is a funny thing like that, where it just comes down to these plays. So they're giving up these explosive rushes that are absolutely killing them. Yes. And then they've also given up a ton of explosive passes and they've been terrible, 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 terrible on third and eight plus. Ugh. Yeah. So they've been getting themselves been into, into these. Yeah. So they've been getting themselves into really advantageous positions. And then they've been not just giving up first downs. They've given up three touchdowns on third and eight plus this year. That's they've had wild. awful, they've had awful penalties on third and on third and eight plus. And they are last in the league in defensive EPA per drop back by a wide margin on third and eight plus. And it's all because they're allowing these explosive plays. And so can it get better? Yeah. If you just stop giving up 75 yard plays. Yeah. It's like, it seems easy, but like, it feels like there's just been a lot of communication breakdowns. And I wrote about yeah. this in my bi-week breakdown. It's like the scheme is complex because they're playing a lot of different types of coverages and they're doing a lot of pattern match zone, which is like a staple of the scheme where you're passing off a lot of routes. And that relies on communication. Like, Hey, I'm taking this guy and you're taking that guy. If this guy runs a slant and this guy runs a flat, all right, I'm taking this guy and I'm taking that guy. I mean, go back to that Seahawks game. Will Disley runs that 
He motions from right to left and just runs a simple flat pattern. It's not like anything like super complex. They just 30 yards up the sideline. They didn't communicate. They didn't know who was picking up the guy in the flat. And he rumbles down the sideline for 30 yards. It's like you posted you, that great video too of Brandon Staley just losing it on the yeah, sideline. On yeah, that play. yeah. And so you know, I I really see it as those as those specific areas. Like I I really believe that the run defense is better <laughs> than last year. It's not saying much, and it is statistically better, but it's because of those five plays that makes them one of the worst run defenses in the league. Like on yeah. Yeah. on a per down basis, they've actually been pretty good. But when they've gotten beat. They've gotten absolutely gashed, and you can. Yeah. T- there's a lot, lot number of reasons for that. Like, there's a reason Mr. Adderley got benched. You know, yeah. he was the culprit on a couple of those long runs. Alohi Gilman and Derwin James and Drew Tranquil missed a, three tackles on Nick Chubb's long run. You know, you make mistakes in this league, and if you don't have somebody that's there to clean it up, like it turns into something that's super catastrophic. And that's what it is. It's not just explosive plays. It's giving up these catastrophic plays. Like you can't yeah. give up a 20 yard touchdown on third and 15. Like you just can't do it. No. And it's like, you look at the play and it's like, all right, what were you according, doing? Yeah. According to, according to Brandon Staley, Asante Samuel Jr. Should have been covering that fade route. Like he should have known that was coming in that situation. He just, you just have players that are not executing, but I don't put it on the players either. At some point, the coaching staff has to say, okay, we might, <laughs> we might have the best scheme in the world on the whiteboard, but if we yeah. can't communicate this to our players, then it's completely meaningless. And yeah. So what do you do? Do you pare it down? Do you, do you make personnel changes? You know, I, I don't know what you do, but it, it has to translate better to yeah. the players so that they can go out and execute and prevent these explosive plays and get off the field on, in third and long. Like that's, that's what I see it as defensively. So yeah, yeah. hope, sure. If they can <laughs> stop giving up 75-yard touchdowns. Yeah, there's a ton of hope. Yeah, I mean, I factored it in before the last game, and they're averaging like or allowing three point nine yards per carry on every rush that wasn't those five plays. Right? You know, yeah, what exactly, I mean? like exactly. That's sub four yards, mm-hmm. in and you'll take exactly. one of the best yeah. run defenses in the league. Like that's the yeah. difference of those five plays is the one of the worst, to, or you know, one of the best to being one of the worst. Like it's it's that Crazy. it's uh, that's really it's what that it simple. is. That's really yeah. what it is. You know, not excusing it, but like no. yeah, that's that's what it is. Like if you want to figure out what's going on, they're getting they're let, they're giving up catastrophic plays against the run and they're they're give they're terrible like like horrific they're, they're allowing teams to convert over 37 percent of the time on third and eight plus i mean on the season they're only allowing teams to convert on 41 percent of all third downs it's like it, it's hard to wrap your mind around how a the team could be that bad like in that situation where it should be super advantageous for the defense yeah. yeah 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 exactly i mean there's just like it's a mix in of just total like good defense, good defense, good defense, total bonehead mistake too. Is like like the Asante Samuel Jr. on that touchdown where it's like everything's good and then one catastrophic thing happens. But mm-hmm. either way, I mean, this coaching staff is going to have to answer even with the injuries. It seems like there should be kind of an urgency in that room, right? Because I think they all know what's at stake. You know, if you have guys like Justin Herbert on your team, right, and everything that comes with being the coach of the Chargers right now. So we're going to get into kind of what the coaching staff might feel like right now and also some lighter things, you know, some things that could get better during the bye week with Daniel Popper coming up right after this. Before we get back to Daniel Popper, I also need to tell you guys about the only place I place my bets, the official sponsor of the Locked On Chargers podcast, and that is BetOnline.net, the number one source for betting football in the start of the new basketball season. One of the things I love about BetOnline is not only is that a great place you place your bets, they also give you all the information and everything you need to make the most informed bets. As always, BetOnline remains your continued source for all sports wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite games and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. With Bet Online, there's no better way to spend your Sunday right now, guys, while football season is still going than getting your bets in at Bet Online and watching it all unfold. I'll tell you one thing that I don't ever want to go out of my way to watch the Bears and the Lions. With Bet Online, I absolutely do, and it makes that game a hundred times more interesting. So make sure you guys head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more because Bet Online is where the game starts. We are back here with The Athletic's Daniel Popper covering all things Chargers, the best Chargers content you guys are going to find. I read his writing after every single game. But, Daniel Popper, there's a couple more things we want to get into here with you, and I want to start with this. I mean, Brandon Staley, obviously, you know, a ton of Chargers fans have fired pretty much every coach. I fired Tom Telesco at one point or another as well. But at the same time, like, it does mean something if you're not making the playoffs with two years with Justin Herbert. Like, they're, with the contracts this team has given out, with the – elite players that they have in their prime, it's hard not to believe that you don't feel that inside that coaching staff. So I was wondering just kind of 
Do you feel like there's an urgency right now amongst the coaching staff potentially feeling like they have to make the playoffs this year or jobs will be lost? Yeah. I mean, you feel that every year. It's the NFL, you know? Sure. It's the NFL. Like, you, you, you have to go out and you have to produce and, and you know, ownership. But he's but not both- getting a bad team with a bad quarterback, though, either, right? I mean, it is. Right. It's different for team to team. Right. You know, I mean, you have to factor everything in. So like, you know, ownership is obviously aware of how injured they've been, you know, but again, like they're four and three and like we, we could be, I could be back on this show in a month and they could be eight and three and we could be talking about them as, as real contenders. Like that's a possibility. <laughs> like, it's yeah. not like, you know, oh, it's not are. like they're, it's not like they're two and five here and like pretty much out of the postseason. Like they're a game back of the chiefs. Sometimes like it that's, feels that way, but if yeah. I don't know what you guys tell we, me, because I don't like it's it's really just the fans the, the the fans have really been bringing a lot of that they just feel like the four and three record is like, more like an know. aberration it's trauma what, man yeah yeah I, it, here's it's trauma I, yeah yeah and, and he, I think it, I think it, expectations have something to do with it too you know you, you head into the season you spend this much money in the off season you have Justin Herbert and you're like all right we're gonna be you know the Chargers the great are on paper up. argument the the well, argument yeah. of on paper <laughs> the expectation is that the Chargers are gonna be blowing every team out by forty but like who does that no, no. you look at the margins of these games I mean throughout the NFL I mean. Most weeks, you don't see a bunch of teams winning by 14 or even 17 points. Like almost yeah. all of these p- games are coming down for no matter how bad or good that team is, it's coming down to a less than 10 point game, right? That's like why the Texans game, like they went by 10 points, double digits, and fans were still coming after them, right? Like it still, it still wasn't good enough, a long scoring drought in the second half. And I think for Chargers fans, it's just you've seen this movie before, right? You know, and over a, a team that's not as good as what their record says at the time and a team that is just, you're waiting for it to fall apart, just like Charger fans are waiting at the end of games for the Chargers to fall apart because of Chargering and all of those things. So you're just waiting for it to to fall apart. And I think this year the red flags are maybe even more glaring than ones we've seen in the past for, you know, teams that are above 500, I guess. Yeah, and, and I get it. Like, I, I'm not convinced that it's a good football team, but I think, like, if you're asking internally, what, how does the coaching staff feel and how does the front office feel? I think they look at it and they say, has it been good enough? Absolutely not. We haven't run the ball well enough. We've been inconsistent offensively. We haven't been good enough in the red zone. We haven't been good enough on third down. Defensively, we're giving up too many explosive plays, too many communication breakdowns against the pass and against the run. But despite all of these injuries that they've had at crucial positions to great players, they're still four and three and only a game back in the division with a chance to do everything that they wanted to do. And so I think the coaching staff looks at it as let's make these fixes. Let's make these adjustments. You know, the one thing that is confusing to me is, is they clearly made adjustments last year during the bye week. Like they were yeah. four and two heading to the bye week. They had the worst run defense in the league that improved. They had the worst special teams in the league. They went out and made moves and that improved. Like they, they've obviously proven that they're willing to make the hard decisions to make adjustments. Like we all saw storm Norton is not an NFL caliber player. They saw the same thing and they made a change. They all saw that JC Jackson wasn't playing well before he got injured. And in they that Browns him. game, they yeah. benched him for Michael Davis. Like the, they've proven that they're willing to make hard decisions and make adjustments. I think that, I think that they deserve a little bit more credit in that regard. And I feel like they're going to make adjustments over this bye week. And I feel like they genuinely believe that everything they want is still in front of them, despite all of the issues that they have. And I don't think that's a crazy way to view it. Like I really don't No, It's not like what, what's what right now. Can, can the chargers win a super bowl? based on wh- what the record is, where they're at. Like, absolutely yes. they can. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely they can. Yeah. And, and well, and so- there's so many teams that are in that, right, Tupop? Like, there, there's only, like, what, the the Chiefs, the Bills, the Eagles. Like, everyone else is kind of in that same next tier, right? I mean, even the Dolphins probably a step below them. But, like, everyone else is four or five wins for the teams, even we thought would be really good. Right. But let's say, okay, Justin Herbert – with a week off as he gets further away from this injury, gets better and looks like more of himself. You get Keenan Allen back, which I feel like is never part of the conversation. I don't know Absolutely. why, yeah, but he's yeah, played 45 absolutely. snaps this year. And he's just you should like know absolutely. it more now because of how bad they've been without him. Right. Never like. talked about, never talked about, I don't know why it's never talked about, but that's been a huge loss. You know, you feel like you, if you, if you can get Joey Bosa back for the last five games of the season, that changes absolutely everything about your defense. And so, you know, I really feel like, you know, they view it as, Hey, we have some serious issues, but we feel confident that we can fix it. And we know it's going to get better once we get some of these guys back from injury. Like, I think that, that's how I think they view it. You can call them crazy. You can think it's ridiculous, but that's how the coaching staff is viewing it. They really feel like everything's still in front of them. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, and and as they should. I mean, I think back to when I played football and like you'd lose a game 38 to 13 at times and you never really thought about it in the locker room. Like, oh my God, like our offense is so bad. Like, what are we going to do next week? Right. It was always just like the next week we'll see, you know, be better. Like you always just kind of felt that way. Like, yeah, I think it's definitely more external, but I mean, I think that's a huge point. We were going to ask about that, the bye week and just hopefully figuring some things out and run defense and especially with their own running game because their own running game has been hurting Herbert. It's been hurting their entire offense. I mean, it's really everything's been kind of, you know, it's even been hurting their defense because two of those long runs you're talking about came after really extended offensive droughts in the second half by the Chargers. And I think that played into impact too, at least in a couple of those games where the Chargers defense was totally worn down. But that's going to do it right for us today with Daniel Popper. Thanks again, Pop, for coming on the show today and everyone else. Make sure you go find him on Twitter at Daniel R. Popper and check out all of the latest content on theathletic.com. Make sure you're subscribing there. Pop, anything you want to tell people about from The Athletic to go check out? Or maybe anything uh, yeah. on the horizon? Yeah, if you haven't already read it, go check out my uh, bi-week statistical deep dive. I do it every year. If you want to know uh, exactly what's going on with the team and why they're not performing the way that they're performing, I would suggest you read it. I put a lot of work into it. So hopefully you can open your eyes a little bit to what's going on and then uh, – be doing a post trade deadline mailbag. So I'll be sending a uh, tweet out tomorrow for some questions and then we'll get back into our regular programming on Friday with the Friday notebook. So uh, yeah, stay tuned. Absolutely. Make sure you guys are following him everywhere to get the best chargers written content in the business. A special thank you to Daniel Popper. Make sure you guys are checking him out on The Athletic if you haven't already, because he really does have the best info out there, but that's going to do it for us on today's show. The great news is, guys, we are back here tomorrow, as always, for free, wherever you get your podcast from. Make sure you're subscribing to us on YouTube so you never miss the show. If you're on there right now, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Make sure to hit that like button if you like the show. And you can find us at any time on all platforms, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever out every day. If you guys also want to find us, you can find us on our social media. You can find me on Twitter at DanTalkSports and David Drogmeyer on Twitter at DrogTalkSD, his DMs are always open or you can find the show's page at locked on LAC. You can also find us on our at locked on chargers, Instagram page or at our locked on chargers, Facebook page as well. Tomorrow though, guys is fan mail show day. We're going to get into our chargers fan mail bag tomorrow. So if you guys want to get your questions and make sure to hit us up on Twitter, you can hit us up in the YouTube comments. You can also call into the voicemail line at three, two, three, five, two, four, seven, nine, two, four. The bye week's almost over. Maybe we'll have a trade that we can be talking about. We can only hope, but we will be back with you guys tomorrow. As always, with the Chargers mailbag, make sure to get your questions in or whatever the latest Chargers news is. So until then, guys, take it easy and go Bolts.